Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Great to be together in worship today. And if you have your Bibles with you, let me invite you to come over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. While you're making your way there, a couple quick announcements for you. I want to remind you, our friend Chef Julio Rubio has released his first book called Cooking with His Love. And it's not only a cookbook, but it's a great testimony of the grace of God in Julio's life. Uh, Julio's going to be with us in all of our services this weekend, signing his book. That would be a great gift for somebody for Christmas. I've read it. It's really wonderful. So stop in the lobby on your way out today. You can get one or five or 12 signed copies of Cooking with His Love. And uh, Pastor Glenn is ministering up at our Stanford Satellite Camp campus this morning is going to be back in the pulpit here next weekend with a Christmas message. And speaking of Christmas, believe it or not, we are rapidly moving towards 2015. Doesn't that sound futuristic? I thought we would have flying cars by now, right, Mike? Weren't we supposed to have the flying cars 2015? But uh, please remember, if you'd like to receive tax credit for giving in 2014, all of your gifts must be received in our office postmark no later than December 31st. And we're so thankful to the Lord for the progress that we see in phase two. Wasn't it great to drive in the driveway this morning and see those big mounds of dirt, amen, and a big hole? And what's better than that is that something's going to go in that hole to the glory of God, amen. So if you can, please help us make the best gift that you can towards your phase two faith promise by the end of this year. And we hope that if you're in town uh, this holiday season, we hope you will join us for worship at Christmas. We have two services on Christmas Eve, one at 4.30 and one at 6 p.m. And then on New Year's Eve, we have a single service at 6 p.m. And uh, in all of our holiday services, there will be child care for kids uh, under kindergarten. So we hope you'll worship with us this Christmas time. Want to begin reading 1 Corinthians 7, starting at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, so that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, <clears throat> a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Jump down with me to verse 32, and Paul continues speaking to single people. <clears throat> he says, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. 
divine instructions about marriage and singleness and also some good counsel from the Apostle Paul. And I want to share with you this morning about seven things to know from 1 Corinthians 7. Seven things to know from 1 Corinthians 7. Let's bow our hearts together and ask the Father's blessing upon us as we look into the Word together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the gift of your Holy Word. It is a lamp for our feet, and it is the only light for our pathway. Jesus said that the Word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that in these next minutes, our hearts would be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the seed of the Word of God. Jesus said that the words that he speaks to us are spirit and they are life. So, Father, send your Holy Spirit and minister life and grace and help to us from the words of Scripture this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, this fall, we've been looking at Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. And the city of Corinth, we've said, was given over to sin and to sexual sin in particular. The church there had a number of problems and it was facing a lot of different temptations. And so Paul wrote them a letter from heaven, a message of grace and guidance from the Holy Spirit that would help believers to become more like Jesus. Paul wrote timeless words that not only helped the Corinthians, but are just as powerful today to help you and me. Pastor Glenn's been taking us through the middle chapters of the letter, and we've seen that Paul's goal in that section is to help us deal with some things that trip us up. So we've looked at issues that have been tripping up believers for 2,000 years, concerns about church unity and discipline, legal disputes between believers, and also sexual immorality. Over the last two weeks, Pastor shared six things that we need to know from 1 Corinthians 6. And if you missed either one of those messages, I strongly encourage you to get a copy of the CD, or you can listen to them on the website. Last week, we heard a very important word about sexual purity. We learned that we belong to Christ and we belong to the Holy Spirit, that we are actually the temple. We are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies belong to him. We learned that sex is not just a biological function. Some people at Corinth had strange beliefs. They felt that the body wasn't important because it was only a temporary prison for your spirit. And so for that reason, they believe that what you do with your body does not affect your inner person. But that is not good Christian theology. What we do with our bodies does matter a great deal. And it's never healthy to violate the Creator's design for sex. Paul teaches us that sexual sin is not like other sins because when we commit sexual sin, we are actually sinning against our own selves. We are using our very bodies that God gave us as a weapon to injure our lives. Sex outside of marriage, which the Bible calls fornication, cheapens sex and it misses the point of why God invented sex at all. God did not invent sex just so we would be fruitful and multiply, but as a way for spouses to express and seal their love to one another so that marriages would be strengthened on an ongoing basis and so that people might be glued and knitted together in their hearts. Sex is not just biological. It is a spiritual experience that is meant to seal an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman. Now in chapter 7, Paul begins a new section of the letter. And if the last section was things that trip us up, we could call this part things we've been wondering about. Paul starts chapter 7 by saying this, Now concerning the things about which you wrote to me. See, the Corinthians had written a letter to Paul first, and for the rest of his letter, which is really his letter back to them, he's going to tackle some of their concerns, questions that they had about marriage and what they could eat, questions about worship and about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and questions about the resurrection from the dead. Paul begins by replying to their questions about marriage and singleness first, and that was probably because he had just finished teaching them about purity. So with all of that in mind, let's look at seven important thoughts from this chapter about human relationships. May the Lord give us grace as we look into some things that we don't always expect maybe to speak about in church. But yet, how many of you know that we need the wisdom of Christ in all things? Amen. 
especially in the sexually permissive day and environment in which we live, if we're going to have healthy marriages, strong families, and healthy relationships, we need to look at the counsel of the Word of God for these matters. Seven things we need to know, and the first one is this. Husbands and wives belong to each other exclusively. Husbands and wives belong to each other exclusively. Paul says in verses 1 and 2, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. We've been seeing that the Corinthians had some very odd, some very strange slogans that they used or that they had adopted in order to justify sinful behavior or strange behavior. And here, Paul is taking one of those sayings of theirs and using it against them. It is good for a man not to touch a woman was a saying of some people in Corinth who had become so super spiritual that they thought they could leave normal life behind and devote themselves completely to spiritual pursuits. In other words, they wanted to live a life of celibacy even if they were already married. Now, not many people would be happy to wake up tomorrow and roll over in bed and hear their spouse say, honey, guess what? I've decided to become celibate. That was one of your few laugh lines, so you should have taken it. You'll get through this, but take those opportunities when they come, please. <laughs> now, spouses in our culture don't often say that to each other, but in Corinth, some people were going in that direction because they thought they were leaving the body behind. And that particular Corinthian slogan about not touching a woman did have a bit of truth to it, but now Paul was going to use that slogan in order to teach them God's entire truth. First, let's understand what Paul means when he says not to touch a woman. He doesn't literally mean that men cannot touch the female of the species. If that were true, even the Duggar family would be in big trouble. <laughs> there could be no side hugs or even handshakes if that were the case. No, what the word touch there means is that it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul says you shouldn't touch a woman that way. That is actually what he meant in Greek. However, in marriage, sexual intimacy is a good thing, and it promotes the closeness and the health of the marriage. Some people have thought that Paul was actually opposed to marriage, that he was anti-marriage, but that is not true. Neither was he saying that sex is a necessary evil. In other words, Paul was not saying that God just allowed us to have marriage as an afterthought so that people could avoid sinning. Here's a tweetable line for you. Marriage was not designed as a remedy against sin, but marriage certainly can serve as a remedy against sin. Paul says, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. When Paul says have there, we have the same situation because that word have was a common Greek expression meaning sexual intercourse. But Paul is not saying, men, hurry up and go get yourself a wife. What he is doing is he is telling people to enjoy sexual relations so that their desires will be satisfied inside the confines of their marriage and will serve the godly goals and purposes of marriage. So let's not misunderstand what God is saying here because God's word speaks to us everywhere very eloquently about the beauty of marriage. God says, how many of you know, marriage is honorable. It is good. Paul's teaching and that of the entire Bible is that the bond of man and wife is beautiful and it is unique. So it's true that spouses belong to each other, but it is equally true that they belong only to each other. Jesus said that this was always God's design for the human race. He said in Matthew 19, From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but they have become one. We are designed, church, to leave and to cleave. 
to leave our parents and then to cleave only to our spouse. One man and one woman make a beautiful new union that God will bless, that God will use, not only to transmit new biological life, but also to pass down the knowledge of God to the generations to come. There is no substitute for the one man, one woman, one flesh bond. Homosexual unions cannot replace it. Adulterous relationships cannot substitute for it. Random, self-satisfying encounters can never be as fulfilling as what God has intended for us in the exclusivity of a marriage. All right, we got one amen. I'm going to have... I'm going to have the rest of you convinced by 11.15. <laughs> I have faith. Now, this is also a clear word against polygamy. And, you know, as pastors, we sometimes do get asked whether God ever condemned polygamy. And the answer is yes. Because here God says, let each man have his own wife and let each wife have her own husband. Polygamy wasn't prohibited in the Old Testament, but wherever we see polygamy in the word of God, there is always trouble. While polygamy may create a lot of babies, it also gives birth to a few other things, to jealousy, to strife, to envy, to murder. And you know, this is not irrelevant, church. Polygamy still breeds sorrow all around the world today. Polygamy degrades children and women. It treats a woman more like property than a person. And polygamy robs a woman of the attentions and the affections of her husband, to which God says here in his word, she is entitled. The New Testament says that church leaders must be the husband of one wife. And so men who come to faith in Jesus Christ, even today, while they have multiple wives, cannot be overseers in the church of Jesus Christ. And do you know that missionaries still have to enforce this principle of the Bible today? Polygamy does not reflect God's design in creation. His plan for us was to cleave to one person only. Nor does polygamy reflect the beautiful marriage symbolism of Christ and his church that we see in the New Testament. And that's the best one-page sermon on polygamy that you're ever going to hear right there. <laughs> Pastor Glenn shared with us how our bodies don't completely belong to us because Others have a prior claim on us. Here in verse 4, Paul says, The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And because of that, not only polygamy, but also fornication and adultery are also wrong. See, when two people enter into the covenant of marriage together, part of what they are doing is surrendering their bodies and surrendering their affections to one another. And therefore, follow me here, therefore, once you've surrendered the authority of your body to another person, you are no longer even free to give it away again because it doesn't even belong to you. Please notice with me also that the Bible gives men and women complete equality in this area. There is no such thing as a man's so-called needs. The Bible never says that men have sexual needs or rights that women do not have. Each party has a claim on the affections of the other, and each party has authority over the body of the other. The first thing we need to know from 1 Corinthians 7 is that husbands and wives belong to each other exclusively. And second, husbands and wives are obligated to give each other sexual intimacy. Husbands and wives are obligated to give each other sexual intimacy. Paul says in verse 3, let the husband render to his wife the affection that is due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. Spouses belong to each other but there is not only a restriction in marriage, there is a duty. It's not simply the case that you may not seek sexual fulfillment outside of your marriage. God says you're obligated to give your spouse the benefits of being in a marriage, and that includes sexual intimacy. 
English translations of this passage can be a little bit delicate, but it is very clear in the original Greek. Paul was not talking in this verse about emotional affection. He was saying that we must give our spouses the sexual intimacy that belongs only in a marriage. Lest I should be unclear, God is telling us that married couples are not to be celibate. God calls us to enjoy each other and to strengthen our marriages by having sex with our spouses. The Greek indicates that when we do this, we are simply doing what is right and doing what is fair by our spouse. Paul wants us to know that neither party to the marriage can, on their own, choose to walk away from the sexual obligation of the marriage relationship. Husbands, you have an obligation to give to your wife true affection, and that includes sexual intimacy. Wives, you have an obligation to give your husbands true affection, and that includes sexual intimacy. It is not enough just to say that we are forbidden to have sex outside of marriage. God gives married people a positive command for the health of their marriage to give themselves to their spouses at every level of intimacy. Celibacy is not an option for married couples. How are you doing so far? If you think it's uncomfortable to sit there, want to switch places with me? <laughs> We need to hear this from the Word of God, amen? amen? And a third thing to know from 1 Corinthians 7 is this, and this is important, third thing to know. Failure to cultivate intimacy in marriage leads to trouble. If you fail to cultivate intimacy in your marriage, it will lead to trouble. Paul says in verse 5, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time so that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and then come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So we've said that neither spouse may walk away from the obligation to meet the sexual needs of the other, but here Paul says couples may agree to be celibate, but just for a time, just for a while, so that they can seek God. Lack of self-control can cause us trouble if we keep apart from our spouses. When temptation comes, Paul is concerned, you may be more susceptible if your desires are not being met in the place where they should be met. Modern translations render this verse as don't deprive each other. But the old King James Bible actually translated it better. It says in the Greek, don't defraud each other. See, when we refuse to refuse to be with our spouses sexually, we are defrauding them. If spouses have not agreed to be celibate, then they are cheating each other, in that case, out of something that God says they're entitled to. And this is a problem. There's an old saying from Benjamin Franklin that comes to mind here. Franklin said, listen, in marriage without love, there will be love without marriage. And I think Ben Franklin and the Apostle Paul agreed on that. You know, church, in modern America, opportunities to be unfaithful are everywhere. They are just as numerous as they were in Corinth where they were saturated with it. Temptations are heightened, Paul is concerned, when we don't enjoy sexual intimacy with our spouses. Unfortunately... It seems that there are too few people who can spot the dangerous dynamic of adultery when it starts to work. Few people notice when they have started down this road that can lead to shame with somebody who's not their spouse. I've been speaking mostly to married people, obviously, so far, but single people, I want you to hear this too because seduction works the same for couples and for singles because we are all made out of the same stuff. And the warning signs are the same. So let me share with you quickly. These are five, I'm going to share five important road signs to watch out for if you want to avoid traveling all the way to the end of the line where you might commit adultery or fornication. These are the dynamics of an adulterous spirit, the dynamics of an adulterous spirit. And the first one is attraction. Attraction happens when you not only notice someone, 
but are captivated by them and you desire a deeper level of intimacy with them. Now, it may not be a sin, of course, to notice that someone is attractive, but lust can be birthed when you dwell upon that other person's beauty. How many of you know Jesus said you could commit adultery in here before you ever acted out physically? And people tend to think that only physical attraction is dangerous. Not so. Attraction is a word that comes from Latin, and all it means is to be drawn towards something. There are many different things that can draw you to another person. It may be their confidence. It may be their kindness, their concern for you. Maybe it's the fact that they seem to be interested in you. Husbands and wives, listen, this is important. It can be anything that creates a contrast in your mind with something in your marriage relationship that seems dissatisfying at the moment. Did you get that? It can be anything that creates a contrast in your mind between what's happening in your own marriage. My husband doesn't talk to me anymore like that, the way that he speaks to me so kindly. My wife doesn't look at me like that, the way that this woman looks at me with, with respect and hangs on what I say. Listen to what I'm saying. The second step is attention. Attention. The second step is when feeling attracted, you seek to have the other person now notice you. This is good here. Attraction is internal, but seeking attention is the first action step, the first step in moving closer towards that person. Third step is admiration. Admiration. Admiration pushes you further down the track. It happens when you seek to make the other person admire you and not nearly not merely notice you. You are seeking to move somebody's heart through these steps one, two, and three, causing them to be attracted to you, making them desire your attention, and then admiring each other. Are you with me on this? Here's where we see those stereotypical behaviors come into play that seem so obvious to everyone except the person who's engaging in them, right? Men may show off. Women may become flirtatious. Both men and women will display their physical beauty to the other. Number four is affection. At this point, the parties have begun to move past a merely platonic admiration of each other's qualities, and they are beginning to stir up inappropriate affection. The Bible speaks of inordinate affection. In other words, affection that is out of order, feelings that do not belong in that relationship. In the dynamic of adultery, this means that you have stirred up feelings or you have inflamed some passions which belong only in your marriage. At this level, a person will probably imagine fulfilling these inappropriate desires with the new person instead of with their spouse. At this level, a soul tie is being created. The hearts of two people who really don't belong to each other are being knitted together. The final step is action. In this final step of action, the parties seal the inappropriate affections that they have awakened. And obviously this happens through physical touch and that can progress all the way up to sexual intercourse. People accelerate this entire process by excessive and inappropriate communication, by becoming confidants, by seeking time alone together. All of those things reinforce steps one through four. And they make it easier for one person, one of the two, eventually to initiate physical contact with the other person. Married people, listen, you need to romance your spouse. You need to woo your spouse. You need to, I got to get at least one on here. <laughs> I mean, I see some hugging starting to happen, but, but, but. But you know, I'm a preacher, so give me one amen. But this is important, church. How are you going to stay off this road? Romance your husband. Romance your wife. Woo them. Make them feel special. Give them what they deserve. Give your attentions and give your affections to your spouse. 
Share your heart with your spouse. Cultivate emotional and sexual intimacy with your spouse. The Bible says that the foolish woman, and it listen, could just as easily be the foolish man, but it says the foolish woman is calling to you, saying, stolen waters are sweet, but it's a lie. Don't believe it. It will ruin your life. Single people, be aware of a special trap for you here. These steps are a subtle counterfeit of a normal process. They mimic what we experience when we as single people begin to draw closer to a member of the opposite sex. As you get closer to that special person, you need to ask yourself, is it lust or is it friendship that has the upper hand? Is it lust or is it friendship that is driving this relationship? Later on, you'll be very glad that you asked yourself that question. Attraction and attention, admiration, affection, and action. These are five signposts on a road that can take us way outside the boundaries that God has given us for our happiness. May God give us grace to see whether we might have turned on to this highway, and may he give us grace to quickly get off that road before we reach the end of the line. All right, fourth thing we need to know is this. Marriage is a wonderful gift of God, and so is singleness. Marriage is a wonderful gift of God, and so is singleness. In verse 7, Paul says, I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and the, to the widows, it is good for them if they remain just as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, Paul is not saying there that he wants every person to be single. What he is saying is that he wishes that everyone had his level of self-control. That's a different matter. We know that Paul was single at this time, but the point is that Paul had the self-control to live as a celibate person. Celibacy has never been an obligation in the Word of God. God knew that human beings needed companionship and sexual fulfillment. And so he said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And he said that even before we fell into sin. Jesus said that not everyone can live celibate because celibacy is a gift. In fact, Paul says in another place that forbidding people to marry is something that is evil. And prohibiting people from marrying is something that has caused tremendous harm and tremendous pain down through history. So when Paul speaks about single people who lack self-control, it is important to know that he is not criticizing them for lacking self-control. What he is saying is simply that such people are probably not called to be celibate. In that case, Paul would say to you, if that's you, seek the companionship of marriage rather than trying to live a celibate life if you don't have that gift. Singleness for Christ, even if it's only temporary while you are waiting for a spouse, is a blessed state. Paul says that singleness is something advantageous for you. In verse 32, he says, those who are single can give themselves more fully to the service of Christ. So if you're single, then in Paul's words, you can care for the things of God in a way that married people usually cannot. Now listen, we've had, we've had some family, you know, dining table talk today. Let's, can we be honest here? Maybe in our circles, maybe it's the case that we don't honor singleness as much as some other church traditions do. You know, sometimes married people need to take a step back or two and honor singles instead of trying to fix them or fix them up. <laughs> but church, listen, sometimes, often, we make singles unnecessarily uncomfortable. And when we make their singleness Topic one, on all occasions, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many singles are dreading the Christmas table? 
All right, we've got some hands there. You know that conversation starts out. So. That'll hit you by noon, it's all right. But when we make their singleness topic number one on all occasions, listen, we are sending a not so subtle message that we see them as only being half people instead of whole people who can serve God and enjoy life. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. But the Bible doesn't say, he who hasn't found a wife by now probably has something wrong with him. <laughs> so let's be a little more gracious to our single friends. Paul actually was probably a widower. Don't have time to explain why today, but that's what many Bible scholars think. But Paul would say, don't feel sorry for me as a single man. He said, I wish you could be like me and have my ability to focus on serving Jesus Christ. And we need singles to know, they need to hear it from us in what we say and how we treat them, that we honor them and that we respect them for who they are right now, for who they are today. We also need to come alongside of single people who do desire a mate and help them stay encouraged and help them pray for God's best will to be done in their lives. And as a friend says, that's good preaching. So <laughs> singleness can be a wonderful gift from God. Seven things to know in this chapter. Here's number five. God gives grace for difficult marriages. God gives grace for difficult marriages. In verse 13, Paul says, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, he says, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. In verse 16, he says, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? The church also needs to stand together in prayer and encouragement for people who are in religiously mixed marriages. Many people who love Jesus are living with a spouse who hasn't yet come to faith. Maybe you're here and you even have a spouse who has no interest in the things of God up till now. If that's you, God is encouraging you that you can be strong in faith and hold on a little bit longer. How do you know, Paul says, but maybe you might still become the instrument of their salvation. In verses 12 and 13, he says, if the unbelieving spouse agrees to live with you, you shouldn't divorce them. Keep praying for them and keep loving them and showing them Jesus as best you can. The Holy Spirit also wants to encourage some people here this morning that the children of such marriages do have the grace of God working in their lives. Be encouraged, mom or dad, about how your kids are going to turn out, even if their mom or dad isn't walking with Jesus yet. A home with two Christian parents, of course, has advantages. But even if you're the only believing parent, God will help you you. He will give you the anointing and the wisdom that you need to reach your kids that it, with something that is more powerful than what your spouse is putting in their ears. Amen. Sixth thing we need to know in this chapter is this. God offers grace when the one flesh bond is broken. God offers grace when the one flesh bond is broken. In verses 10 and 11, Paul says divorce in general is not permitted for Christians. We know that there are scriptural exceptions to that general rule. Pastor Glenn preached a wonderful sermon on divorce uh, a while back ago, and if you'd like to hear an in-depth message on divorce, we can point you to that. Paul does tell us that if you've been deserted by your spouse or if we become widowed, then we are free to marry again as long as we marry a believer. But it's important to note that God can support us and God can encourage us in the aftermath of a divorce or widowhood or whenever the one flesh bond has been broken. You know, church, these are some of the most painful experiences in all of life. And yet we know the love of our Heavenly Father that He is so tender. 
He can be a comfort to us in any sorrow and be a true friend. So I want to encourage some here today to, to seek the one who says that he will stay closer to you than a brother. I want to encourage you to seek the one who says that the very hairs on your head are all numbered. He knows you that well. And I want to encourage you to seek the one who says, I am the one who lifts up your head to encourage you. If you've been deserted by your life's partner, if you've been made to feel worthless by somebody who betrayed you, then run to the God who says in his word, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I have drawn you to myself with cords of loving kindness, and again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt. So church, we need to be aware of those and come alongside those who have suffered these losses with caring, with compassion, and without condemnation. God wants to give people grace when the one flesh bond is broken, broken so many times through no fault of their own. Seven things that God wants us to know about marriage and singleness from 1 Corinthians 7. And the last one is this. No matter what your status in life, your life will be a blessing if you consecrate it to God. No matter what your status in life may be, your life will be a blessing if you consecrate it to God. Worship team, you can come back and help us. Listen to what Paul says in verse 7. Each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Each one has his own gift from God. You know, church, we know this is true. Not all of us have the same status. Some are married and some are not. Some of us chose our status and others never really expected to find ourselves where we are today. Some are happily married and some of us are just fine being single. Thank you very much. Some of us long for a spouse and yet some of us wish they could escape their loveless marriage. And whether or not you're happy with your marital status or whether, frankly, it's just not your biggest concern in life anymore, we all have this one thing in common. There is someone who does have first claim on my heart. And every one of us needs to give our heart to him. Jesus makes every joy of a married life or a single life sweeter. He gives grace to help us and to carry us in every challenge, both of the single life and the married life. In this respect, we are all the same. Whether you're a married person or whether you're single, whether you've been widowed or divorced, the Bible says that we all live to him and we all are called to live for him. Well, we've covered a lot of ground this morning, but this is what we need to focus on as we close today. When you place your marriage or place your singleness in his hands, he can beautify it. He can make it something that is holy, something that is good, something that is wholesome and productive, even if it's been tainted by sexual sin or if pain has damaged. If you're married today, why don't you consecrate yourself, consecrate your spouse, and consecrate your marriage to God afresh so that you and your spouse can serve God together and be fulfilled together in him. You may need prayer. You may need help. You may need counseling to get your marriage back to where it ought to be, but that's okay. It's worth it. If you're single today, for whatever reason you might be single, why not consecrate yourself and consecrate your singleness to God so that you can find security and find purpose in him. Again, you may need prayer. You may need counseling. You may, may need accountability to stay on track, to stay pure for him. And that's okay. It will be worth it. And if you are seeking a spouse today, God can give you grace in the meantime while you wait. Here's my advice. Stay right here at Harvest Time Church because we have a pretty good track record in that department. 
May the Lord help each one of us to recognize his good gifts in our lives, no matter what we've done in life, no matter where we've been in our life's journey. Church, God wants all of his people to walk in wholeness. He wants married couples to love each other fully and exclusively. He wants single people to feel honored and welcomed in the family of God and feel that they can serve God in their singleness. He wants all of us to come alongside single moms and come alongside people who have unbelieving spouses and come alongside widows. God wants all of us to experience lives of wholeness. Pastor Glenn likes to say that there might be nothing missing and nothing broken. God wants you to know, church, that no matter what your status, you can find healing and your life can be a blessing as you consecrate it to him. God wants all of us to know that in Jesus, there is mercy for your past. There is grace for today and there is hope for your future because we serve the one who said, behold, I make all things new. Come on, let's stand together.